Uh, on behalf of the ESPRI committee, I'd like to welcome you uh, all to the second online seminar of 2024. And today's theme is taking the magazine out to the metropolis. It's long been apparent, I think, that periodicals can describe the locations in which um, they're published and through news and reportage also bring the outside world into those spaces. Um, but in addition, I think, um, um, in addition to describing, they can also help shape those spaces, define their identities, draw their borders, if only as imaginary ones, and by doing so, also define what they are not, um, in part by othering uh, those outside them or even within them as different or um, even hostile. So the relationship between periodicals and geographical, political and cultural spaces are ones that I think are pretty fundamental to our understanding of how they, uh, how they work in particular contexts. And that I think is particularly interesting when these periodicals are, or, or clusters of periodicals, are products of regions that are outside the centers of political power, and thus very often also of cultural power. Now, to discuss these issues, we have two very distinguished uh, scholars with us today, both of whom have made significant contributions um, to our knowledge of this key dimension of our field. Um, so we have two papers covering two very different locations, both outside the cultural cause of their respective, uh, re re respective capitals, but which also, to a greater or lesser extent, I suppose, sought and indeed continued to seek to define the, those non-metropolitan spaces in particular ways. Our first speaker is Dr. Andrew Hobbs, himself once a journalist, now senior lecturer at the University of Central Lancashire, and whose book of Fleet Street in Every Town um, won the, uh, uh, which is on the provincial newspaper press of the late 19th century in England, won the RSVP Colby Book Prize in 2019. He's also a co-organizer of an upcoming international conference, uh, which will be held in Chester on the 25th and 26th of June this year uh, on the theme of place and the periodical. Uh, and the call for papers has gone out. I think the closing date is the end of January. And I think, I think uh, Andrew is putting up the website address um, uh, uh, into our chat so that we can all um, tune in to it. Um, uh, that will certainly be the place to expand on these very issues, I think, in the, um, in the, in, in the, coming, in the coming months. Our second speaker is Dr. Fabio Vidali. He is a contemporary historian at the University of Milan. He's a specialist in intellectual and cultural history of 20th century Europe. Uh, as he works especially on networks, on associations, which include, of course, those of journalists and periodicals, newspapers, and so on. He's the author of two biographies, uh, one on Gabriele Mucchi and another on Umberto Campagnolo. He also coordinates a national project on discrimination in post-war Italian newspapers. Uh, welcome both, and thanks uh, to, you, to you both for participating today. So, Andrew, may I hand over to you to uh, present your paper, please? Thanks, Alan, and uh, thanks to Esprit for giving us the opportunity. Um, so I want to talk about the as Alan said, about the wear of magazines and, and whether that makes much difference. Um, and so this is, yeah, one of my opening questions. Um, do we have a, a, a kind of an assumption that the magazine is intrinsically metropolitan, that uh, it's something that comes from cities and, and, and presents um, the culture of cities? Um, I suppose that this, my whole paper <clears throat> exhibits my own personal status anxiety, perhaps, which um, maybe connects to the status anxiety of certainly some of the magazines in England that I'll be talking about. Um, I wonder if we look down on magazines that are produced in kind of cool cities um, and, and 
I think you could argue that some of the magazines I'm going to be talking about are der derivative and perhaps they are second rate. Having worked for one of them, um, they, they do sometimes employ some second rate people. Are they are they conservative culturally and politically, um, low status within journalism and, and within academia? They're certainly very uncool. Um, so therefore, what significance do they have? What influence have they had on, on other magazines and on other media? So if, if any of that is true, why is it true? Uh, if it's not true, then, then what can we say about the significance of the regional magazine? So just to, to uh, establish the, the, param the param parameters, um, I was looking at this, uh, the second book on the screen, this uh, big um, list of regional interest magazines in the United States. And the two authors, Riley and Selnow, they they don't really define the regional magazine. They just say what's in and what's out um, in their, their listing of 920 regional interest magazines. Uh, the little potty biographies in, in the, the book at the bottom of the screen. But they um, include city magazines, but they exclude other magazines um, that I've put there on the screen, farming, academic, institutional titles. So my scope today is similar, um, but, but perhaps even vaguer in uh, not defining it. So I'm talking about things that are not national, they're not local, I'm talking about magazines, not newspapers, um, but then, you know, there's lots of fuzzy boundaries. Um, when is a magazine turn into a newspaper? What's a newspaper supplement, which Riley and Sell now excluded, but I, I would include. Uh, <clears throat> I'm interested in any historical period, any place, uh, and at any genre. Should I include city magazines? I, I haven't done so far, but I wonder whether I should include city magazines as well. I'd be, be interested in your thoughts about that, or are they something very different? When I talk to people about, I'm looking at English county magazines, I'm doing quite a bit of research about them. And when I say county magazines to people in the UK, people don't know what I mean. So then when I ask them, where, where are you from? And then I name the title relevant to their county. They understand, uh, but they never quite occurred to them that there might be other county magazines and other counties. So examples seem to work well. So here's some examples on screen uh, from past and present. So um, Manchester produced Ben Brearley's journal in the 1860s. Palatina was a newspaper supplement from the Rhineland Palatinate. Um, that was uh, Anne Viola, uh, it was published from in the 1870s. De Steele, that was uh, Delft and Leiden uh, into the 20th century. Double Dealer from New, New Orleans. Hola from uh, Barcelona. Britannia uh, magazine from Brittany. Southern Living um, from Alabama. And another magazine from the Phelps, if I pronounced that correctly or not. Um, is it is yeah is, is this is a regional magazine even a coherent or a useful category uh, i'd be interested in your thoughts about that they, these seem such a disparate um miscellaneous collection of titles that i wonder how useful it is to to group them all together so uh, as a brief case study before opening out on, into some uh, wider issues i'm going to look at uh, 20th century english county magazines um and um, this was a this is a commercially successful sector. It's shrinking as most magazine markets are, but there's still about sixty five titles in England. Um, they sell around about a million copies. They're probably read by six, seven, eight million people. Um, and and sim a similar genre in the United States, for example, Southern Living was the most profitable magazine in the country in the nineteen seventies. So these kind of regional, fluffy, lifestyle-y magazines. Um, they are an important commercial sector and perhaps are worth studying for that reason alone. In England, uh, the first one that I would recognize as part of this genre, genre came out in 1926. Um, and then a few more came out in the 1930s, connected to rural community councils, which were coordinating bodies there was a lot of anxiety about the need to revive the countryside and rural life and crafts and so on. So a lot of them were associated with those bodies. After the war, there was another boom. Um, a lot of them were produced by the same publisher, but other publishers also had a go. Um, and then 
I mean, I, I've only concentrated on um, these magazines up to the 1960s, but there was another boom in the 80s and 90s, uh, you know, a time of, of um, sort of a consumer boom in England as well. So I'm just going to, just as a way of giving you a flavour of what these English county magazines are like, I'm going to um, focus on the 1930s, when, which was their first heyday, and just list some techniques of the way that they capitalise on county patriotism um, to, to sell copies of their magazines. And the magazine that Fabio will talk about, Sole Dele LP, uh, uses some of these same techniques as well. And it, 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 I think it makes us think about regions as constructed um, imagine, Im, imaginaries, I suppose, um, and how media contributes to the construction of the, these ideas of the region. So photography is very important for these magazines. So lots of pictures of local beauty spots, kind of domestic tourism, lots of pictures of um, domestic, of, of local beauties. Um, so Cheshire Life stole this idea directly from a national magazine, Country Life. Um, they were nicknamed Girls in Pearls because they tended to be debutantes, women being presented to the upper class marriage market, uh, wearing their pearl necklaces um, uh, available for, for marriage. And so Cheshire Life took that idea and they had heiresses and debutantes and ladies and countesses and so on. Uh, linking up to county institutions. So the county, I haven't had time to explain really, but the county is an English, uh, well, a, a British and, and Irish um, administrative unit, um, quite an ancient unit going back a thousand years or more. And some of the institutions such as uh, military uh, regiments and so on, militia, go back quite a way as well. And then there's things like agricultural shows, um, hunts, uh, fox hunting, organizations that have a county identity as well that these magazines connect to. Uh, traditions, history, local distinctiveness, very important element of these magazines. And the philosophers say that um, personal identity is, is based on continuity and memory. And I think that applies to um, the histories of places and identities of places. This continuity in history and memory <clears throat> is very important. Um, so, for example, here's something about Cheshire architecture. It has a distinctive half-timbered uh, black and white architecture. So they, that features quite a lot in this Cheshire County magazine. And then the literary county. So poems about the county or inspired by the county, uh, sometimes short stories. Um, a standard feature in these magazines would be uh, the literary associations of that particular place, that particular county, so novels set there, or a famous local authors, or um, famous poems, or, or stories that are set in that county. And then um, book review pages. So this is one example that the only place where you can find books about a particular county collected together, curated together, are in a county magazine, you know, um, who else would want to bring them together in that kind of way? I mean, county libraries do the same sort of thing, but on the page, uh, this is where you'd find the literature of your county gathered together. And then maps, uh, we're talking about geography, so an obvious technique um, defining the territory. Um, and I suppose it, uh, Alan alluded to kind of uh, us and, you know, what, othering and us and them. And so this is one example of that who's within the boundaries and who's outside them, often using adverts. That first one is for a, a chain of uh, motor garages around Sussex. This one, it's um, the Cheshire Life started as a, an industrial uh, promotion magazine, trying to bring industry into this relatively wealthy county of Cheshire um, in the interwar period, just at the end of the Depression. So this is a map of Cheshire showing where the different types of industry are. And then the advertising uh, uses similar techniques as well. So tailored patriotic advertising, such as um, Avon rubber products made in Wiltshire. So if you need a new tire for your tractor, buy a, a locally made tire, um, buy a insecticide made in Kent, um, 
Sussex Beer for Sussex People, um, Rights Hertfordshire Cider. So lots of appeals to local patriotism. So that's just a sort of a quick run through the kind of ways that they would uh, build on, on local patriotism. Things that you might not find so much in these particular types of regional magazines are othering. Um, there's very little um, us and them in them. It's more about just us. We are great. This is a great place. And very little about other places, just very occasionally. Um, you find very few negative stories there. These are feel-good magazines. And you find very few people that aren't white in there as well. E even today, that that's still the same. Um, so <coughs> they, they, they make money. But do they have anything interesting to tell us culturally? Um, I think they do. Um, so yes, in some ways they are derivative, but then that's what media does, isn't it? Um, media is always stealing good ideas from other media. Um, you know, newspapers are made out of other newspapers. Um, and if something works successfully in one place, then that genre quickly gets stolen by other media. So, so yes, that happened with Cheshire Life. Um, but then on the other hand, uh, if you remember back to the Budapest Esprit Conference, uh, Beatrice Joyeux Brunel was talking about um, her visual contagions project and seeing how um, modernist uh, visual images tended to appear not in what we thought of the centres of modernism, such as Paris or London or New York, but um, in, in places perhaps in East or Central Europe, in second cities, third cities, and, and then moved to the to the metropolis afterwards. Um, and then uh, an example of a, re a very successful regional magazine, um, which well, began in Barcelona in 1944, Hola, uh, Hello magazine, invented a genre. Um, but then again, on the other side of the argument, where they just, is this an example of using the region as a test bed before going for the big national and international markets which are the real markets is it just for amateurs the regional market the sort of questions that i'm interested in um and then this yeah this whole thing about kind of status anxiety and being second rate um so the region is something that's in between the nation and the locality and perhaps has less valency and importance in our lives and certainly in some um of the cooler cultural movements such as modernism, people would be quite anxious not to be thought of as regional. Um, even though, I think is it what this book that I'm quoting from here, White talks a lot about localist model, modernism, which he thinks is more radical than the conservatism of uh, regional magazines and so on at that time. Um, the idea of regional being anti-modern and, and Fabio's magazine, um, I, I think could be called anti-modern. Um, and certainly the magazines I'm looking at in England, they're very much about the suburbs um, and the sub suburbs are considered as non-places. They're not real places, they're inauthentic. And is that the case with these magazines as well? And then I think a, a lot of it, I was really blown away by uh, Rita Felsky's article back from, was it 1990 or 1991, about being lower middle class and it really connected with me because I think that's where I come from. Um, just how uncool it is <laughs> as a class. It's, uh, you know, it hasn't got that radical chic of the working class, that gritty authenticity. It hasn't got the, the, the cultural, the political power of uh, upper middle classes or aristocracy, gentry. Um, it's kind of stuck in the middle and no one wants to be it. No one boasts about being it. And I wonder whether it's a bit like that with these magazines. They're very aspirational. And if you aspire, that means you don't want to be where you are now. <laughs> and I, think, I wonder if... It, and there were two great papers at the Leeds conference last year, one from about an, an Australian magazine, one about a magazine in Paris, um, that were very, very uncool and had a sort of cultural cringe. But there were guides to cultural capital, like guides to how to be cooler, how to move up the status ladder. And I think these county magazines are very much like that as well. Um, <clears throat> and some people, other people have you know, been working on this for quite a few years, such as, um, um, 
I can't see the top of my screen, so I can't remember who the other author is. It's Hamill and um, Smith. Yeah, this idea of reclaiming the the middle brow magazine um, and, and sort of the value of being middle brow and this thing about yeah gaining capital cultural capital so it's all very very uncool and it's all very very interesting i think um so yeah to, to finish off some questions um just to summarize some of the questions that i think can be asked about these magazines if we think it's a coherent category uh, and that first one is what can regional magazines do that metropolitan magazines can't? You know, what is different about them? Is, is there anything uh, specific and characteristic about them? And then if we think that there is, then, you know, a whole agenda opens up. So how regional identities differ um, and, and change over time, you know, the whole historical aspect and how some regions have stronger identities than other, others. So, for example, um, just googling around i found three magazines published in Brittany, in france but i couldn't there were some other département of uh, france where i just couldn't find any regional magazines and i know Brittany does have a very strong uh, regional identity but people might even say it's not just a region it's more than a region the same with cornwall uh, in england some people would call that a nation and, and, and not a county um sense of place yeah so linked to that sense of place and how how these magazines make money out of sense of place and appeal to people's sense of place and then yeah the, how this connects to the national is it a zero sum game i think i remember is it lenin in uh, what to do that pamphlet in 1901 was saying um, if russia is going to be socialist it needs just one national socialist newspaper it doesn't need any local papers we need unity and that leads on to thinking about sort of secessionary movements, uh, such as the one that, that Fabio is looking at in Italy. Um, you might think of Nigeria. There's, there was a, a very lively magazine published from the north of Nigeria called Hot Point um, um, in Kaduna. And then there was, you know, Ebo magazines at the moment. Um, and then the development magazines and these especially perhaps more than newspapers are very much about consumption with the advertising and about class um how does this link to place um consumerism politics we need to come up with a typology of these publications and then some possible methods mapping leaps out but there's lots of other methods that would be useful as well and particularly bringing together you know we we know that magazines are multimodal that's why we love them so bringing together words and images, editorial and advertising, I think is crucial. And then, yeah, to, to end on this whole thing about uh, status anxiety and cultural status within the market, within journalism, within the industry, within academia, uh, and this thing about aspiration and the middle brow. Uh, and that's it. Yeah, and this is a conference that, that I was mentioning. If any of these ideas uh, intrigue you, I, I will put a link in the comments as well. So I hope... Um, I'm interested in your answers to some of my questions. Thank you very much. Okay, good. So uh, thank you, uh, Andrew, and thank you, Esprit, for this opportunity. It's good that Andrew went first today, of course, because my paper is on a case study, a specific case study. But in order to introduce this case study, I have to introduce also uh, what the Northern League uh, is, uh, this political party. I don't know how many of you have uh, already um, well encountered this uh, Italian political party, which is still very strong today. Um, between the 19th and the 20th centuries, journalism in Italy made it its mission first to facilitate, then to support national integration that had been achieved in 1861. From then on, the daily newspapers, uh, while still having an almost exclusively regional circulation, aspired to become part of the Italian journalistic scene as the voice of the entire nation. In other words, they favored national content while looking at its relevance for the local milieu. 
Thus, newspapers continued to be circulated, with a few exceptions, only on a regional level, but one can no longer speak of local newspapers in the full sense of the word. The real watershed, uh, even at local level, uh, came only in the 1980s, uh, due to the success of commercial television, which revealed the transformations and the vitality of the Italian provinces. Although the information system was hegemonized by television, there was still a lively local advertising market, which found its core in the local press. But what about weekly magazines? Um, in Italy, uh, weeklies are the offspring of a different tradition. While daily newspapers were characterized by editorial centralization and a close relationship with, with politics, weeklies sought their audience on the basis of quality criteria, not geographical distribution. The weekly in post-World War II Italy tended to be a national product because it aimed for the widest possible market. Furthermore, while the daily newspaper, which was purely politicized, tended to impose its views on the reader, the weekly tended to shape itself according to the preferences of the public because it was in its interest to be as transversal as possible. For the reasons I have just stated, the case study I am presenting today is quite peculiar. In fact, I'm going to talk about Sole delle Alpi, a weekly magazine conceived for Northern Italy only, thus already uh, very different from the traditional weeklies with a national focus. Um, Sole delle Alpi targeted the militants of a party, the Northern League in Italian, Lega Nord, uh, thus um, a political and regional weekly. Um, although this is a special case, uh, this does not mean that I, it cannot contribute to a reflection on the phenomenon of regional mag magazines, which is, of course, my goal. But first of all, I must briefly introduce the political formation to which Sole delle Alpi, Sole delle Alpi, delle Alpi means son of the Alps, uh, was linked. The Lega is today the oldest Italian political party. It originated in several areas of northern Italy around the 1980s within the framework of the many independence movement and the manifestation of ethnic political conflict that characterized that era, uh, not only in Italy, of course, but in Europe as a whole. It not only aspired to give shape to an idea of a people attentive to localism, but built a true us versus them system where they, them, was represented by the central bureaucracy, by Southern Italians immigrating to the North, by immigrants from non-European countries. These people from the North, according to the Lega Nord, would have a fairly defined territorial basis, the regions of Northern Italy, later called Padania, and economic and political goals, namely fiscal autonomy and self-government. And here you can see a map of Italy and allegedly a map of Padania. This, you can find it, this map of Padania, you can buy it on Amazon if you wish. The Lega Nord the first allied with Silvio Berlusconi and his newly formed Forza Italia party in 1994, but the two parties were competing for the same center-right voters. For reasons of convenience, the Lega broke with Berlusconi and, in order to reaffirm itself, it no longer insisted on a reform of the Italian constitution in a federal sense, but on northern national independence, on secession. It decided to pursue a cultural effort for the creation of Padania as a multi-regional community held together by a common culture through symbolism and ceremonials and the development of a Padanian patriotism. The focus here in my presentation, therefore, is on the late 1990s, the phase of greatest effort of cultural elaboration on the part of the Lega Nord on the basis of a vast macro region vaguely corresponding to Northern Italy. 
I live in the background what the party has become in the following years that is an increasingly national, Italian national and nationalist party, which has cancelled its uh, secessionist prerogatives. So in the late 1990s, the Lega wanted to justify the autonomy or even the separation of the people of the North by insisting on the existence of a history and culture that differed from the rest of Italy. When speaking of culture, however, uh, here one does not mean elitist or academic culture. Uh, in fact, the Lega has always insisted on its anti-intellectual character, on its supposed ability to interpret the needs of ordinary people in contrast to the traditional parties. Actually, anti-culture snaked through the ranks of its militants uh, and electorate, along with machismo, misogyny, and homophobia. The Lega Nord committed itself to a composite cultural elaboration mixed with propaganda, uh, through which it claimed cultural differences between the autonomous northerners and the centralist southerners, and even ethnic differences due to the Celtic, or in any case, barbarian and northern European, not Italic, origin of the peoples of northern Italy. The most striking example is precisely that of the references to these Celtic peoples in correspondence with the promotion of a Po Valley nationalism. The Po Valley is at the center of the region of Padania. It is hard to identify Padania with a specific region. Padania is defined in a vague way as the land of the Gallo-Italic and Veneto peoples. It was stressed that the borders of Padania could be set on the basis of historical, geographical, ethno-linguistic, socio-economic characteristics, even if there were obvious contradictions. For example, Veneto, the Venice region, does not have a Celtic origin, uh, the same Celtic origin of Piedmont, Lombardy, or Liguria. If not properly invented, um, this narrative was nevertheless, to all intents and purposes, instrumental. And while the invention of the nation might have had a certain appeal in the 19th century, even among the democratic and educated bourgeoisie and aristocracy, a century later, it could only make its way to the lower strat of the population, the lower middle class Andrew was talking about. Uh, just a couple of data, in 1997, a survey showed that 41% of legisti had only a primary school diploma, and that 50% of young people in Lombardy and Veneto left school at the age of 15. So it is clear that there were precise socio-economical socio and socio-cultural factors behind the success of the Lega Nord. I cannot focus today on the entire propaganda system of the Lega Nord, uh, which was also made up of a daily newspaper, a radio station, a publishing house, and a widespread presence in towns and villages through high impact political posters, which played a big role. I will only discuss the weekly Sun of the Alps, um, an organic enterprise of the party, which was published between 1997 and 2004. Uh, the editor-in-chief was Gianluca Marchi, who had, uh, who had had a career in the regional daily press. And managing editor was Roberto Poletti, at the time just 26 year old. Um, he headed a small editorial team of three female journalists. Uh, the first issue came out in September 1997. You can see the cover here. The weekly presented itself as the weekly magazine that burns all others, il settimanale che brucia tutti gli altri, putting on the cover a bonfire of magazines such as Panorama, Oggi, and L'Espresso. This already tells us a lot about the type of editorial product we are dealing with. It wanted to be a political periodical, attacking the positions of other competitors in the market. Those that burned were, not by chance, national weeklies, um, its competitors. The burning was a way of saying we are going in a completely different direction. Uh, the point, in fact, was not the political line. L'Espresso um, was left-wing progressive, Panorama and Oggi were moderate. The point was not 
politics, but precisely the nature of the product. The first issue, this first issue already features articles such as Bossi, uh, so the leader of the movement, and A Year of Padania, which shows how focused the periodical was on the leader and his glorification. Le Donne dei Serenissimi, the wives of uh, the most uh, aggressive militants, an article characterized by uh, strong uh, machism. Um, Un'estate stuprata, which shows colorful use of language to denounce rapes. Uh, in order to understand uh, the intended identity of this weekly magazine, um, one can read its presentation, which states that the magazine described, I quote, the world seen through the eyes of the people and looked at in the aspects, events and problems neglected by the mass media, and that it wanted to bring back to the reader the essential of things, a taste for analysis and investigation in those territories so uncomfortable for power in the name of the ordinary person. With this insistence on ordinary people, of course, ordinary people from, the, from Northern Italy, it was intended that the weekly be divided into three sections. For the father of the family, in blue, for the mother, in yellow, and for the children, in lilac. This was undoubtedly an innovative idea compared to the weeklies, to the Italian weeklies of the time, which were usually divided by audience, uh, even the mainstream ones, especially since they were normally gendered. The aim was to broaden the interaction with viewers, sorry, with readers, uh, without any preclusion. However, this tripartition of the magazine was abolished after only a few issues, also because it could not work. In fact, Sole delle Alpi also contained very, I mean, very explicit sex columns, and it is hard to believe that a magazine of that kind could have passed quietly from hand to hand within families, all the more so since the readers probably had a conservative, a conservative background. Um, here you can see a couple of uh, covers. Uh, this is the leader uh, on the left, the leader of the movement, Umberto Bossi, in a warlike pose. On the, the right, uh, Basta Conquesto, stop with this, that is stop with um, foreign immigration coming to Italy. These are just a couple of examples. Um, I am not in possession of sales figures, but it is certain that Sole delle Alpi did not have a very large distribution and did not go beyond militant circles or perhaps sympathizers. Many readers, according to the letters received by uh, the, the, the periodical, liked the product. We know that the feedback, at least compared to expectations, was initially positive. It is also claimed that there was no overlap between the readership of this magazine and the readership of the daily uh, La Padania, because the weekly apparently had a more widespread circulation in the central Italian regions. It could be bought at newsstands, so it was not reserved for militants, uh, like a real commercial enterprise, but it was clearly a propaganda, news, uh, propaganda magazine. Yet it is interesting because it also had all the typical characteristics of a regional and anti-urban enterprise. It was a reactionary weekly reflecting the backward character of the Northern League. Uh, I just mentioned this poll. Is it right for women to be in politics? Or the article uh, entitled, if he is in politics, in which women were advised, I quote, Obstructing him is always a mistake, much better to stay close to him and try to understand him. Mm. Not to mention sexism. Here, for instance, on the right, uh, you can find uh, a cover. This is uh, Selene, uh, uh, at the time a very famous, uh, a very famous Italian porn star uh, who actually 
voted for Lega Nord, the title Padania per questo piaci, Padania, that's why people like you. Uh, so because you're a beautiful woman, that's it. Very sexist uh, cover, of course. Um, and it was also, uh, I would say, low brow, low culture weekly. Uh, for example, on the left, you can find um, a cover painted by the painter Luigi Reggianini. Luigi Reggianini uh, was very praised uh, on uh, all uh, the periodicals published by the Lega Nord. Uh, Luigi Reggianini uh, voted, of course, for, for Lega Nord. He may have had a good resume, uh, but in my opinion, his art was uh, far from excellent. As you can see here, uh, the themes of his works were, frankly, ridiculous. For instance, he painted things like the Celts cavalcade, or the Poor River Missile with inscription 1997 setting sail from the Italic Swamp. So things like that. Um, as I said, not really middle brow, but low brow, in my opinion. After a few months, the reference to the Celts, the Breton people, and all the struggles for the protection of minority cultural identities increased. But I think that the most interesting point relates to the series of reports um, entitled Le città del nord raccontate dalle persone che lavorano e producono, Northern cities narrated by the people who work and produce by Ippolito Negri. Each reportage followed the same structure and was based on interviews with ordinary people and Lega Nord city administrators. The problem of traffic and the shutdown of shops in city centers, the pressure exerted by supermarkets on small shopkeepers, and the immobility of non-league administrators were reported in all the cities that were visited. Every week, the militant, the militant reader, flipped through pages that told of deindustrialization and a failure to engage with the technological revolution, thus of opportunities lost by the province. And in the meantime, they absorbed the propaganda issue of that phase, for instance, uh, about the opposition to the construction of new shopping centers. Um, the modern city in all its meanings was therefore viewed not only with distrust and fear, but even with animosity. There would be many other aspects to emphasize, but time is a tyrant, so uh, I want to try to summarize and answer, and, and answer some more general questions. Um, first of all, um, I do not believe that Sole delle Alpi can necessarily be indicative of a trend, given its political uniqueness as uh, a political product. Uh, can it be referred to as a regional magazine? It was certainly not national. Uh, it covered a region, or rather an unidentified area of northern Italy. It was talked not by chance of a I quote, a country of the soul. It was claimed Padania is a feeling. Um, so there was undoubtedly a kind of geography, but it was not a physical geography, but a geography of desire, a spiritual desire to use Martha L. Henderson's expression. Therefore, the case of Padania is a special one. It is not, so Padania is not at a, an administrative region and it has never even been too clear what it encompasses. The Northern League with its editorial products tried to create its culture, although perhaps what counted was the presence of a certain oppositional us versus them and basically xenophobic mindset. Sole delle Alpi was a publication focused on the provinces, on provincial towns, on the countryside, the mountains, everything that was not central or centralized. Within the framework of the Lega's historical geography, Padania, as the land of the Celtic peoples, was naturally opposed to the city centers and to Rome and the Romans in particular. It was insisted that the Romans had failed in colonizing the countryside where the traditional agro-pastoral civilization would have survived. 
This makes one thing clear. The Northern League was not a metropolitan phenomenon, but was mainly successful in the provinces and small and medium-sized towns in the north. Not for nothing, its social block was in the small business and its workers, precisely the most vital part of the Italian economy, foreign to the liberalism of Silvio Berlusconi, who represented another world, the world of service providers uh, and large scale distribution, as well as that of the new finance, of television and so on. The Lega was a movement part of the North, I'm quoting here, but of the periphery of the North, as Manuela Cartosio wrote. All this was mirrored, not surprisingly, in the magazine Sole delle Alpi. Sole delle Alpi, in the end, seems to me a case of a regional press that was not middlebrow, but even lowbrow, capable of, uh, capable of reflecting its reader, who was also, in all likelihood, a Northern League voter, its right-wing, strongly populist radicalism made it a product of great interest, although reading it today leaves, I must admit, a feeling of unease. Thank you.